welcome everyone to the fourth webinar in our webinar series um, on COVID-19. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Zach, and I'm the policy director at Remix, a single platform that enables cities to see their mobility data in one place, plan a holistic network, and coordinate across stakeholders. Over the past two weeks, we've spoke with UITP to understand how Europe and Asian agencies are responding. We spoke with Transportation for America to learn what the CARES Act means for agency funding. And I believe the FTA just put out guidance today. Um, so we'll dig more into that and maybe have another webinar. Um, and we spoke with Jarrett Walker about how to think about service changes in this crisis. All of these webinars are recorded including the one we are in right now and are posted at remix.com backslash resources. They will also be emailed to you so you can look out for that. Uh, one thing we have been doing in these webinars is encouraging agencies to post their updates in the chat box. We know that conditions are changing really quickly and that you need a place to connect. Uh, in fact, the chat has been so vibrant with updates that we have decided to create a private Slack community for people working in transportation. This will be a global community full of Remix's 300 customers, you, um, our policy experts. Um, and so we'll be posting a summary of the updates we've seen so far, as well as other COVID-19 resources for the global transportation community. But we mostly see this as a place where you can answer one another's questions. Um, we didn't want to leave you in the lurch at the end of this series where so many people have been connecting and sharing their updates. So each of you will be receiving an email with an invite to transportation to the Remix Transportation Talk Slack community. Um, and I think that we will also drop the link to this um, to signing up in the chat. Okay. Um, and because, because we can't just end um, <laughs> there's more. Um, so for those of you who currently have Remix or those of you who are just curious about Remix, um, we did tack on another webinar where we will be diving into how to use Remix for service changes in COVID, as well as the types of data layers you can now upload to make your custom, your customized maps um, and engage with your uh, community. And we'll talk about that um, actually today, just how agencies are having honest conversation and, and keeping their uh, ridership aware of what's going on. Um, but yeah, so Remix is hosting uh, a webinar to help both our customers and those interested in Remix um, understand how to use the platform to plan during this time. And that will be um, on April 7th. You don't have to remember any of this because it will all be posted in the Slack um, channel. So if you are, uh, so the, the one thing you should remember is to sign up for that where you can get all of these updates. Okay, so like I said, we are on our last webinar in the series. Um, how this works and how it's worked in for other uh, others is that 30 minutes of question and answer with our guests. Um, today it's Stephanie and Ben from Transit Center. Thank you guys so much for joining. Um, and then it will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A with the audience. Um, we encourage you to share your updates in the chat box, but your questions and answers to Stephanie and Ben, please put them in the Q&A box. This will help us record the questions in case there are any left over, um, as well as let us you know, see if there are multiple of the same. Um, so please just follow that protocol as best you can. Okay, and so um, as I mentioned, the conditions are changing rapidly and many of you have information you'd like to share with your peers. Um, do that in the chat box. We love to see you, be, you connecting, so we definitely encourage that. So how this is going to go, we're going to spend a little bit more time looking at our faces today than we have in the past. 
Um, so we, like you, are signed on from our homes uh, where we are all practicing social distancing. Social distancing creates a novel problem for transit. Ag um, agencies are working to keep the lights on, keep buses clean, keep coverage um, up, and to get essential employees to their jobs in buses as empty as possible. Uh, never before have we been asked to be so inefficient in some ways um, <laughs> uh, or have faced such fear of use. So today's guests, Stephanie and Ben, will help us understand the work that their organization has been doing to highlight the position transit has been put in, as well as uh, what we should be anticipating in the future. A little bit about our guests. So Stephanie has a diverse um, experience in transportation sector, assisting cities with implementation of transit systems that improve urban livability and economic opportunity. She was most recently a program manager in the US and Africa office of the Institute of Transportation and Development Policy, where she worked on projects in Chicago, Albuquerque, Kampala, and Uganda, oh, in Johannesburg, South Africa, and Nairobi, Kenya. Her work focused on helping cities to implement bus rapid transit, bike and pedestrian projects, as well as to finance and implement high quality transit oriented development around transit corridors. So she has quite a breadth of experience to draw from in today's conversation. And I can't wait to get kind of all over the place um, with the kinds of questions we can, we can answer. So, and Ben, um, Ben oversees Transit Center's press strategy and communications. And previously he covered the movement for better transit and more people-friendly city uh, transportation systems as editor in chief of a little publication you probably have heard about called Streets Blog. So welcome you two. Thanks, Rachel. All right, so let's do this again. Okay, so Transit Center has been writing some hard hitting pieces on the impacts of COVID-19 um, and its impacts of transit funding. And I wanna get into that, but before we do, can you guys tell the audience a little bit about Transit Center and the kind of the, the um, what you what work you've been doing and uh, you know your place in the world of advocacy. Sure. Um, so Transit Center is an advocacy foundation. Um, we're based in New York and we work to improve public transit across the U.S. Um, our work focuses on two core areas. Um, the first is growing civic advocacy for transit, and the second is improving industry practice in three areas: um, governance workforce and talent and operations. Um, our work is mostly delivered through research, um, synthesis of practice, um, and grant making to mm -hmm. civic advocacy organizations. Um, and also, um, you know, in Ben's role, and we have some public opinion work going, um, we work to help influence kind of the public discussion about transit in the US. Um, and then finally, you know, our origins are in New York. Um, and we're based there. So we also are very active in the New York advocacy community, um, the New York City transit advocacy community, um, pushing for better service and governance of the MTA as well. Wonderful, yes. I have been an admirer of your uh, organization's work for some time, and I, I really think you have been very effective at um, keeping that national conversation, uh, driving that national conversation. So um, one of the things or ways that you've been influencing the current national conversation is that you recently estimated the annual financial impact of COVID-19 on the on US transit agencies could be up to 38 billion. I was wondering if you could walk us through some of the numbers you've been seeing from, um, you know, from agencies facing the increased operational costs and decreasing sales tax and fare revenue. Uh, just walk us through sort of what your findings were and how you got there. Sure. Um... So first, uh, I should credit uh, Stephen Higashida, our uh, research director for this work. Uh, I'm drawing it directly from, from his output. Um, and so what we've been seeing is that agencies are uh, encountering anywhere from a 50% to 100% loss in fair revenue. 100% uh, loss is when agencies make the decision for uh, health and safety re reasons to forego fair collection. Um, we're seeing somewhat less steep, but like very, very severe uh, losses in sales tax revenue that tends to be more in the um, 30 to 50% range. Um, 
And then there's sort of this unknown, we, we're gonna start seeing it soon, but the effective uh, you know, direct um, state and local subsidies, we think that will be in the range of 10 to 30% loss. Um, and at the same time, agencies have to shoulder these new costs uh, in terms of cleanliness and protective equipment that um, according to APTA uh, come out to, I think it was 1.5 billion for a six month period. So we think this is going to be, you know, it's worth extrapolating for an entire year. So we peg that cost um, uh, in the four to $5 billion range. Got it. Got it. And, and can you walk us through, were you working with Transportation for America or how, how did, how did this, um, you know, make its way uh, and, and have such an impact this estimate? Um, well, first uh, we, I just want to say that the, when transit agencies were open and transparent about the losses they were facing, that was immensely helpful to us in putting this together. And we really relied on the public communications um, from agencies, whether it was on social media um, or through local press reports. They're reporting on their own fair loss um, and tax deficits was, is the basis for this work and helped us conceptualize and put out these numbers. Um, and so uh, our role, uh, because we are a private foundation, we don't do the lobbying ourselves. We're not down in DC talking to representatives. Um, but what we can do is describe the problem. Um, and so the thinking was, um, you know, we are in a position to really make the full scope and brunt of this problem publicly known and, um, and just, you know, walk, describe it in a way that will be understandable to your typical elected official in DC. Um, so just basing all these estimates on you know, real world reports and summarizing in a, in a fashion that can be digested in like a one or two pager uh, for these elected officials. Um, you know, it's really up to the organizations like uh, Transportation for America to then take it and get it into the right hands. And I think we did see you know, very rapidly um, there was a shift from almost, you know, really nothing for transit in the earliest versions of the latest rescue package yep. uh, to 25 billion in the house version. Um, you know, it's able to be used in a way that federal transportation funds typically are not. Um, you know, the key is flexibility. Agencies need to be able to use this in any way they can because, you know, everyone is in a triage situation right now. Um, so the fact that this is available for all aspects of operations um, is really critical. Uh, and thankfully the, the house version is what made it into the final bill. Yeah, that was a tremendous amount of work. I mean, it was a nail biting two weeks to go from nothing to 25 billion. And you guys were, you know, this estimate was very integral to putting some hard numbers behind what exactly is going on um, for agencies. And, and you're absolutely right. Like during a time of a crisis when our agencies are being very creative and in their response and are critical to getting, um, you know, I think Beth mentioned 36% of, uh, which might be a number from you guys, but 36% of essential workers um, actually are transit riders. Um, you know, so keeping coverage is, is important. Um, you know, you don't wanna be worried about whether or not those costs are going to be covered or what pots of money they're coming from. So I think that work just was, you know, critical. Um, and speaking of creative approaches, you've also done some writing about ways that transit center or transit, excuse me, that transit agencies like BART or Houston Metro are responding op um, operationally to COVID-19. Um, and I have some slides from your blog. Um, so here, Metro's print shop has produced over 200,000 materials, um, encouraging social distancing on transit. That's directly from your blog. Um, and some different approaches across the globe to sort of protecting drivers. I'd love to hear your perspective on some of the best cases of agency communication to the public, creative thinking, and protecting operator health during this time. Ben, do you want to start that off? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think that I can speak to the operator health and service changes piece. Um, you know, I think that we're seeing a lot of agencies adjusting service um, because of financial and ridership cha changes and challenges. Um, but we're seeing that agencies are really looking at who's riding and when they're riding and shifting their services to 
um, really cater to those riders. Um, you know, you're seeing trends like early morning frequencies, which is when a majority of healthcare workers are going in or other essential workers, like childcare workers, for example. And we're seeing lower frequency during the time that normally there is higher frequency, like the, you know, peak hours that um, most of us go in, which is between like six or eight, six, between 6 a.m. and eight or 9 a.m. Um, we're also seeing increasing frequency to routes with major, major destinations like hospitals um, and in locations where essential workers live and where, you know, people are still needing to ride transit. A lot of, um, you know, low income people, people of color communities um, are still riding transit and are still needing the frequencies um, that um, are, are still needing higher frequencies. Um, and you know, the operator health issue is something that we're getting pretty um, deep into at the moment. Um, unfortunately, PPE, as we many of us know, is really scarce across the country and across the world. Um, there's a major supply chain issue going on. Um, but you know, our operators are actually first responders and they desperately need it. Um, in New York, which we've been tracking, you know, there have been nine deaths of operators and there's almost 600 cases, positive cases. Um, and generally, we're not seeing many agencies having access to personal protective equipment like gloves and masks, um, particularly the N95 masks and disinfectant wipes. Mm. Um, you know, some of them are getting um, surgical masks, which is better than nothing. But, um, you know, the amount to which these operators are exposed um, is pretty significant. And they really do need the kind of protective equipment that um, are be being given to other kind of first responders. Um, as you showed in your slide, you know, a lot of agencies are on the buses protecting operators by physically barricading um, behind the first wheel well so that passengers like actually can't approach drivers. There's a lot of um, rear door boarding going on, eliminating fare collection. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of agencies requiring the plastic protective barriers um, that are, um, you know, that prevent people from engaging with the driver if they're still, you know, boarding through the front door or if, you know, they need some kind of assistance so that, you know, there isn't, um, there's a barrier between passenger and operator. Um, but, you know, there's a lot that we still don't know about the virus transmission in enclosed spaces. Um, there's a lot of concern about um, ventilation on buses that we don't know about mm. that are particularly, you know, hazardous to our operators right now. Um, I know that Singapore had a lot of concerns about that and they were really diligent about cleaning their ventilation systems um, and circulating their air on the buses, both, you know, within the, within the vehicle and then outside of the vehicle as well. And that was really important. Um, but the fact is, is that we're really short on PPE for operators and it's a huge priority um, that I think needs to be paid attention to, um, particularly in the coming weeks and months. Um, or else we can, you know, we might see some pretty significant changes to the way that our systems are operating or potentially not. Yeah. Enough. So just a quick follow-up question on that. I'm just curious um, in your work, are there any administrative tasks or, or things that agencies can do to help you know, in this narrative that, you know, their drivers are first responders and need to be classified as such? Yeah, um, I think it's really just talking about it more. Um, you know, we're seeing our elected leadership recognize first responders, um, recognizing our medical workers, our doctors, our nurses, our grocery mm -hmm. store attendants, um, and transit workers are sometimes in that mix, but sometimes not. Um, and we need them to be recognized kind of at the level that these other first responders are. I mean, you know, there's there seems to be a hierarchy of first responders emerging and we need to kind of push back on that, that they're, you know, all doing really essential services. Um, and, you know, I think that agency leadership, working, working really closely with our unions is super important um, to kind of put our operators like front and center, um, showing that they are, you know, they're people who have families, they're some of, you know, our most um, vulnerable and you know they really need the kind of attention and care and prioritization um, that some of the other kind of essential workers are being given right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then you know some other things that I've heard that I think are great, um, just on this theme of you know what agencies can do is that 
I've heard some really great stories of agencies like being right on the front lines with their operators. You know, a lot of us are being told to work from home and there are certain people that can't. And there are some agencies like CTRAN in Clark County, Washington, that is actually telling their management staff to kind of go out and be there at stations for operators, you know, showing support, ask, answering any questions, you know, helping with passenger needs, um, you know, just to show that there isn't kind of a hierarchy between the people that work at their agencies, that everyone's in this together. And I think that that, you know, there are things like that that go a long way. Um, in Pittsburgh at the Port Authority of Allegheny County, the CEO is in the depots every day, talking to operators, asking them what they need. Um, and, you know, those actions are really important in terms of morale and getting people to you know, show up and literally risk their lives for, um, to, to operate this service. So. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing those stories. Um, one thing to add on, uh, in the Pittsburgh example that Stephanie mentioned, um, you know, when management has this good relationship, uh, with the transit operators, um, you know, that's enabled Pittsburgh to do some things that are beneficial to both the workforce and the ridership. Um, so what stands out in terms of uh, practices there that I think should be become more widespread during this time is that they are um, they're adjusting the operator shifts so you don't have this concentration of workers at the depot and people can keep a safe distance when they're at the at the depot or at the garage. Um, at the same time, that enables them to still continue to provide service uh, at a level where they can let riders keep their distance on buses. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, yeah, there's all these connections when you're making these service changes um, that you need to consider. And that, that doesn't just include connections of buses, it includes you know, time spent at the depot as the driver. Um, that's something that, they, that should also be included when considering these service changes. I hear you, Ben, I think that's really, really interesting and, and um, would love to hear more from Port Authority. I'm not sure if anybody's on, but feel free to drop something in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, all right, so uh, okay. um, so Stephanie, when you and I spoke over the phone, you brought up some uh, concerns for agencies that had planned to go to the ballot with sales tax initiatives in the, in the short term. Um, can you share sort of more about that and sort of like the long-term funding concerns um, that we might need to take action on sooner rather than later? Yeah, I think that, um you know, this crisis is going to fundamentally and has already changed our society. And um, it has the potential to also like fundamentally shift like travel behavior. Um, you know, I think we've talked a lot at Transit Center about, you know, the worry that they're, uh, the worry that people will develop a, a lot of concern um, about using or being in shared spaces like public transit um, and, their, and, and also to, um, to support it financially. You know, our funding mechanisms for transit are somewhat flawed. Um, you know, we're reliant on sales taxes or other kinds of, um, you know, ballot measure based support um, that rises and falls dependent on good economic times or bad economic times um, and then also fares. And so, you know, we're already seeing our economy kind of um, um, fall significantly, um, and it's likely to get worse the longer that, you know, we're social distancing. Um, and, you know, with the prospect of, you know, a pretty severe recession, it could make people really hesitant to um, support ballot measures that are scheduled for the fall. Um, CFTE, um, which is an APTA project um, that looks at ballot measures across the country shows that there are about 20 measures um, that are currently planned that have various funding mechanisms, um, bonds and sales tax and other things. Um, um, and between like June and November and two have already been pulled um, from their scheduled times. And we're just concerned that, you know, people will either choose not to go to the ballot, um, therefore reducing further support for transit and then, or also that they'll go and they'll fail um, and, you know, again, transit will be kind of left in the lurch in a particular moment of crisis. Um, so, you know, we're just, um, you know, really the future of transit is at stake here and, um, and it's, it's a really uncertain time. So I think that, you know, the messaging from agencies, from our elected leadership, um, really needs to be there for transit and, um, 
dispel any kind of fears about shared spaces um, and transit in and of itself um, and just, you know, ensure that this is a really needed service. It really um, bolsters our economy um, and that investing in it is investing in coming back. So, Ben, do you have anything else to share on that? Um, I would just say like we will be on better footing uh, going forward um, if we convey the essential nature of transit to the emergency response now. Um, and, you know, at the same time that transit is getting hammered, it's really apparent that we need good transit to, um, you know, staff our hospitals, our grocery stores, and all these essential functions that are keeping cities running uh, right now. So, um, I, I think if we just keep at that message that transit is essential, um, we will be in a better position when the recovery starts. Yeah, and I, when we had talked to T4A, Transportation for America, Beth Osborne was on here saying that, um, you know, the numbers that, uh, you know, you guys pulled together, um, as well as some numbers they ran and APTA, these are all really important, um, but so are capturing the stories of um, those who are getting to work right now on transit. Um, which I think was a really interesting tip and something that I'm certainly already uh, trying to capture from friends who are, you know, the lone riders on BART going to their hospital jobs, et cetera, right now, um, just to, to round out that uh, storyline that is going to be critical. And I do find it heartening that we went from no, men no mention for transit to $25 billion, um, meaning that the, the work you guys are doing to, to to kind of showcase this story of essential, how it's essential transit is right now, um, is being heard at least at the federal level. Um, and that is uh, encouraging, uh, I would say. Feel free to contradict. <laughs> um, so both of you have had long careers with global and natural scopes. Have you ever seen anything like this before? And do you have any sort of historical lessons um, you wanna share? Um, nothing, nothing quite like this. Uh, I think, um, you know, there's never been a situation before where like a full bus is bad. Right. Like, this is a new thing. Um, the severity of it is worse than anything I've ever seen uh, in terms of revenue loss. The threat to health and life is unlike anything I've seen before. And, um, you know, the, I think the lesson is that we have to be nimble and the response has to be based on the specifics of this condition. If there is like a historical analogy, it would be, um, you know, the 2008 recession. Uh, and the way the government responded to that for transit just did not align with uh, the needs that transit agencies were facing at that time. Um, you know, this recession uh, basically forced agencies all over the country to cut their operating budget and cut service. Um, but the response in the stimulus bill was a bunch of uh, capital funding. Um, so the, there was this mismatch where agencies were firing bus drivers and hiring construction workers. And um, I think we have to avoid that this time around. The, what we've seen from Congress so far is a good start. I think it, it, is, it bodes well that the $25 billion, um, you know, had very few strings attached. Um, and, but also, like, this is so severe and so unprecedented that even this amount of money, um, especially for big agencies that rely on fair revenue, uh, it's not going to last as long as we think. Like, the, the next emergency is right around the corner. Yeah. And I'll just echo that. I This is not anything that I've seen before or experienced. I've worked in East Africa during the Ebola crisis, but where I was, was not um, affected as much, um, you know. So I know that in West Africa, which was the heart of it, there were temperature checks and transit wasn't running, you know, or the informal transit wasn't running. But um, I think this is pretty unprecedented globally um, at the moment. Okay. Um, any, before we move to Q&A, I was just wondering if 
there's just any words of like hope or a nice story <laughs> that you guys wanted to sort of end on? Um, I, I mean, I think the way people mobilized very quickly uh, to get action at the federal level, um, that should give us hope. Um, you know, that is a story when everything was going well or when everything works well, it's a story about um, riders and advocates working together with agencies. Um, there has to be like a mutual trust. The agency has to be open about the challenges that it's facing and what its needs are. And the riders and the advocates um, have to like hear the agency and you know adopt a position where they are trying to support what the agency needs in order to provide um, safe conditions for workers and safe service. Um, and I think, you know, there was definitely this uh, mobilization where everyone was pulling in the same direction at the same time. And that's what we're going to need uh, throughout this crisis. Yeah. I think that I've been, um, what I've found interesting and uplifting is kind of the collaboration between um, the workforce and management at a lot of agencies that I've been hearing about. Um, a lot of mutual support. I think that, you know, we're seeing obviously absences, but um, a lot of operators are showing up because they see it as their job and they are first responders and they're doing a really important, important service to their communities and to the country. And I think that that's really amazing. And to see, you know, agency leadership and management supporting them um, by, you know, committing to continuing to pay them for full-time work and, um, you know, adopting progressive sick leave policies that, it, you know, incorporate both operators and their families. And, you know, I think that those kind of movements are really um, great to see and hopefully will continue after this, um, this crisis, this immediate crisis ends. Thank you guys. And we're going to move to Q&A. So just a little reminder to drop it in the Q&A box. Um, if you have a question, that's where we're going to be looking. So maybe you put a question in the chat box. Um, we're going to miss it if you don't put it in the Q&A box. So please um, drop it there. Um, and we'll get started with um, Ezekiel. Is there any evidence uh, that operators are as exposed as the first responders in hospitals? Um, that would be our first question. Um, no, we don't have any hard evidence that um, that operators are more exposed or at what rate they're exposed, but um, you know, yeah, it's it's anecdotal. But Ben, do you have? Yeah, I mean, I think the what we've seen is that um, you know a, a phrase I've seen used to describe transit operators is unsung heroes, but really we should be singing about them and like just letting the world know that they are doing, you know, dangerous.